hotel Dip your heart in the stream of life Let the pain and the sorrow Be washed away In the waves of his mercy As deep cries out
Jameson is, and so, yeah, they put me. They put my mic on just as I said that. <laughs> That's all right. Are you good? All right. Sorry about that. If you're watching at home, I got. I was answering a question. Good morning. Oh, you guys! I catch you with that every week, don't I? You you think by now? Anyhow, it's good to have you here today. We're glad that you're here. And I uh, hope you came looking for a blessing today. Uh, we're just going to pray that God could w- be with us and watch over us. We've got a number of people today that are out with illness. Uh, the whole Ludwig clan is down. Uh, not down. They're really not that sick, but they're all positive with COVID. Uh, so they're not here today. Um, Jeff Barger and his bunch, Jeff's tested positive and And it seems to still be making the rounds. People are are testing positive. I haven't heard of many people getting real sick from it, but people testing positive. And and, uh, we were were watching Jameson last night, and he was a little snotty, uh, so Camille kept him home today. We're not going to shove anything up his nose to test him. Uh, He's only five months old. But uh, anyhow, um, and that probably took Aaron and... Tyler out. I don't know if they'll show up or not. I don't know if, all, if, if he's keeping all three of them home or not. But anyway, it's good to see you. And we, uh, we hope that you uh, are just, uh, just enjoy the services today. Let's begin with a word of prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning recognizing that you are our God, recognizing that you are our Lord and Savior, recognizing, Father, that all the praise of our hearts, all the glory that we can manifest, everything that is in us, we need to point towards you because you're worthy of it all. And Father, we just pray that you would just be in our midst this morning as we share this service together. Father, we pray that you'll be with those of our number who can't be here today. Father, there's a number that are out for various reasons. Some are traveling today. I know Lee and his family are traveling, uh, taking their son back to college. And there's others that are, are busy and traveling. There are some that are ill. There are some that are being precautious. Uh, whatever, Father, the situation is, we just pray that you'll be with them. Let them know that we miss them. And Father, that you are uh, with them as well as in this place today. Father, it is absolutely a waste of our time, a waste of everybody's time to come here and not invite you to be at the center of it. Because Father, just listening to some songs and listening to a sermon that doesn't have you at the center of it has no point. So Father, we just ask that your spirit have liberty to speak to our hearts today and that you be at the center of all that we say and do. And we'll glorify you and praise you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. I forgot to get a bulletin. What's our first song, John? The light of the world is Jesus. Let's let's stand together as we sing, shall we? Sunshine and noonday, his glory shone in. 
They was both waiting for the other one to come in, come first. <laughs> it wouldn't cover both of you. I know that for a fact. <laughs> All right. All right. Let's sing happy birthday. Junior church, you're dismissed. If you're watching online, I want to remind you to go ahead and just type your prayer requests into the um, type your prayer requests into the comment section, and we'll get those in just a little bit. Um, I, I got a, a message early this morning, I think it was this morning, maybe, yeah, I think it was, it was this morning, from um, Tim Park's family, and uh, they had been watching uh, the services online last week, and they thanked us for making those available, and said Tim continues to, um, I should pull that up, I don't want to, I don't want to say it wrong, but I'll just give you some some information, but Tim continues to keep going, and uh, they're very thankful for that, and they thank you for the prayers, but uh, let's see, where's it at? You might know when I want to pull something up quick, I can't do it. Here we go. Um, it says, good morning, this is Suzanne Park. Several people have asked for an update about my dad. Uh, you are welcome to share this with your congregation if you would like. My dad, Tim Park, is still in Morgantown. He has not been accepted at any of the five locations we agreed to due to COVID outbreaks um, or lack of beds. He is doing really good in PT and OT. He loves cards, messages, prayers, and he is, and he is receiving. And while he can only have one visitor a day, we are making that work too. During the week, my daughters and niece each take a day, and Dad's cousin, Jack Bowman, who's more like his brother, visits multiple times a day to fill in when the girls aren't able. Mom and John and I are, are the weekend warriors making the most of, vis of visiting hours. Our request for prayer is this, continued pain-free healing, the swelling in his leg to subside, the placement of quality, safe rehabilitation facility closer to home, continue receipt of excellent care and access to PT and OT, and peace and comfort for Mom. Please thank the congregation for their heartfelt prayers. You all are such a blessing. So just wanted to share that with you. Um, 
what Tim's status is and continue to pray for him and let let you know uh, the blessing that uh, we're able to share just by also being able to share this online. So we're thankful for that. <clears throat> um, after church, need some helpers for a few minutes to tear all this down. Uh, I would have torn it down this week, but I left Tuesday to go up to take care of dad for the week. And uh, so I didn't get it torn down and I just need some helping hands. We're basically, it's just going to kind of get busted apart. And, and so it's not going to, it doesn't take any re- finesse or tools. We're just going to kind of tear it apart. It's served its purpose. And uh, if you're willing to come up and help, the only thing we're not going to tear up is this. It's just got to be taken apart and moved back into storage. So either that or move to the basement. We haven't decided yet. I got to ask a couple people. But anyhow, um, if you're willing to help us do that for a few minutes after church, uh, just come on up. And I've kind of asked Dean if he would kind of just oversee that. I'll be in the back. And so however you want to do it, Dean, if you just want to pull it apart, kick it apart, chew it apart, I don't care. Uh, you just kind of see how it'll happen, okay? Um, also, some help is needed. The ladies would like to make apple butter, but a lot of the ladies that have always made the apple butter said, you know what, we need some younger ones to help make the apple butter, or we need many hands to make the work light. And so uh, if you're willing to help, there's a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board in the back. This is not a sign-up sheet to order apple butter from. This is a sign-up sheet to say, yes, I will help make the apple butter. And that means you're willing to stand there and stir the kettle and feed the fire and do all the stuff that needs done to make the apple butter work. It's a day's job. And uh, so uh, if you're willing to help with that, please sign up in the back. Go ahead to the next one. Of course, Tuesday night, our Bible study continues on Psalm 119. Go ahead. Um, Mops is going to be having a cookout this Friday at 6 o'clock at the pavilion. All mothers of preschoolers welcome. And that just looks good, doesn't it? I had to put yum underneath it. Food pantry still is needing things, and uh, so want to want to encourage you to make those donations. Doesn't have to be just the things that are on there. Uh, I must have deleted one that I didn't mean to delete. Um, the about the kids going to um, OCC, uh, but I want to remind any of our teenagers: the third and fourth of December, the first Saturday Sunday. In December, we're going to go down Saturday and work at the the processing center. And kids from all over the region, all over the all over the air, all over the northern part of the United States, have been invited. That are part of the Covenant Brethren Church have been invited to come and be a part of that. And uh, so we're going to be there with like 30, 40 other kids. Uh, maybe we're, we're going to have to cut it off at that. Um, If we get more than that. So, but I would love to see all of our teens that are eligible to go, go. And uh, it just been a a cool opportunity. If you've never been there and never seen the processing center, um, it is an amazing process to get all of those shoe boxes processed. I don't know how many shoe boxes get processed a day, but it is a huge number. And they literally do millions and millions of shoe boxes a year. And uh, so we're going to be a part of helping to process that. And we've opened it up and invited kids. I've received calls from churches in Pennsylvania, from Virginia, um, and so, and as well as West Virginia. And we're going to go down there and, and try and make that happen. And I'm looking forward to it. So keep that in mind as something I'd like you to be a part of. Want to take a moment for prayer requests. Does anybody have any prayer requests this morning? Yes, Juanita. That was the other ones I was thinking of, yeah. Yep. Christy and Kevin. They're down. I mean, I don't have to. It's just part of life right now. Um, It's going to be the rest of our lives. COVID is going to be here, and we just have to reconcile ourselves with it. Um, Any other prayer requests? Yes. Yes. Oh my, Dale Pennington, okay. All right, yeah, George. Yep, yeah, and now Rocky. 
Okay, well, I, I thought she said in her thing this morning that Rocky was positive, but she said, he's feeling okay, yeah, 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 okay. Any other prayer requests? Yes. Jim Hot's family, okay. Any unspoken requests this morning? All over, okay, all right. Let's, oh, we have two that came in. Sherry Alt, uh, we need to keep in our prayers, and also Leslie Kreitz. So, yeah, we want to keep all of those in our prayers as well. So let's just go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Heavenly Father, I don't know how to convey the depth of conviction I feel about this time and this moment. I don't know how to express how deeply appreciative I am that we have this opportunity to come before you on behalf of individuals who are in need and ask, Lord, for you to meet them at that point of need is an incredible opportunity. And one all too often we just take for granted. It's just part of the service. It's that time of the service, and so we just kind of do it, not realizing that in this moment we are coming before the God of all creation. We are coming before our Lord and Savior. We have come, we're coming before the sustainer of life. We're coming before our King. So Father, we humbly come to you this morning. Coming not of our own authority, but because you've told us to boldly come before your throne and cast our cares on you because you care for us. We come before you thanking you for the privilege that we have of doing this and thanking you for the opportunity that we have of touching the lives of other people through prayer. And now, Father, as we come before you with these requests, both spoken and unspoken requests, we thank you. We thank you that you hear. We thank you that you are willing not only to hear, but answer prayer. And Father, we come before you in faith believing that you will touch the lives of these individuals, meeting them at their point of need. And Father, according to your will, meeting their needs in their life. Father, we pray that you would just bless and guide the remainder of our service today. Be with the message when it comes time for the message. Father, just glorify yourself in every part. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. George, could you or Marcia, I know you heard a gazillion stories from the girls while they were here. Is there anything you could just come up and share a little bit about what's going on and what they're going back to and what they're in without breaking any confidences? I know. It just popped into my mind while I was praying. I thought, you know what? Because they popped into my mind. That's the way God works, you know? He just says, hey, talk to George and Marcia. Come on, George, and help us out. <sighs> what a sigh. They heard you clear over on this side of the church. Bring this mic up. I think I can talk loud enough. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just a quick update. They're currently in France. Uh, all the mission trips, all the mission teams that are doing overseas trips over in that area, they all meet in London, or in, in France, rather. Um, for some training before they go out. They'll all be leaving out tomorrow, I believe. Is that right, Marcia? To their all to their destination. So uh, travel prayer, prayers for travel mercies for them. They're going out to their destinations. But uh, tomorrow, Danielle, Shana, and their mission team will be going back to where they were at last year. Um, and, of course, I can't divulge that location to you, but it is the Middle East. Uh, and it is a, uh, a Muslim primarily Muslim religion, so that's what they're working with and trying to witness for Christ to those people, which is extremely difficult because that religion is very deep-seated in that. So it's it's a difficult thing to do, but it's a relatively safe area. Uh, They don't seem to feel uh, in danger ever. Actually, they say that they feel a little more safe there than they do when they're here in the States. So that's, you know, here we are in a free country, and they feel safer there than over there, but... Um, I don't really have too much more that I can really tell you. Um, they're going to be gone for another 10 or 11 months, so we won't see them till uh, May or June of next year. So, 
uh, just keep them in their prayers and their entire mission team that they are successful in what they're doing. And then, of course, we know that Christ is watching over them. They wouldn't have let them. He wouldn't have let them there if he wasn't planning on keeping them safe. And it's a goal that uh, he set forth for them. So just keep them in their prayers. Thank you. Do you, are you able to send them, a, is there some channel you are able to send them yeah. packages or things? But are you able to like send a care package or something? Okay, I didn't know if there was a channel you could do that through or not. Okay, okay, all right. All right. I uh, was looking at a couple of, of uh, songs that I wanted to do this morning, and there's so many songs, so many good songs that are out there. And uh, I, I promised Holly that we were going to do one this Sunday, and I forgot until. So we'll eventually get to it. But I'm going to invite Holly and Donna and whoever, Mary and whoever else is going to come up and. and uh, uh, come on, Holly, you're supposed to be a part. And uh, we're just going to sing a, a few, uh, a couple of songs. The first one, the first one is something that I so often need to remind myself. Some people have told me, they'll see me driving down the road. And I don't know if this ever happens to you, but they'll see me driving down the road and they'll look at me and say, I saw you going down the street and you looked like you were mad. Is everything okay? And I, no, I'm not mad. I wasn't mad. I, I was just thinking, and that requires effort and uh, straining. And you know, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. But but uh, you know, the, we're supposed to be reflecting the light of God's love in what we do and who we are and what we say. And and sometimes people look at us and and they see that grouchy old look on our faces instead of seeing the light of Christ shining through our lives. And so we need to remind ourselves that not only does Christ to shine, but he's supposed to shine through us. So the first song we're going to sing is Shine, Jesus, Shine. Will you stand with me, please? Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness shine. Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us, set us free by the truth you now bring us. Shine on me, shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine, fill this land with the Father's glory, blaze, Spirit, blaze, set Displayed your likeness and 
should be something we, we tell ourselves all the time. How many of you believe... That's not fair. I don't want to do that. I started to say, how many of you believe you died today, you go to be in heaven? But if you're looking forward to a home in heaven, if you're looking forward to a home in heaven someday, and you have... A relationship with Jesus Christ. How is it that we walk around without joy sometimes in our hearts? It means we've got our eyes off of all that it means to be a child of God. And we've allowed something else to consume our minds and our thinking and who we are and what we do. Because if we really focus on what it means to be a child of God. Then this next song, How Do I Keep From Singing, ought to be on our lips all the time. You may not know it, but you'll learn it. i 
seem when I lose my step and I fall down again. I can see cause you pick me up, see cause you're there. I can see cause you hear me alone when I call to you in prayer. I can see with my last breath, see for I know that I see with the angels and the saints around the door. How can I keep from singing your praise? How can I ever say enough? How amazing is your hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with your everlasting love. Father, sometimes in our lives for reasons we don't completely understand, we feel so distant from you. There's so many things that draw us toward the world and away from you, towards our own opinions and ideas and worries and concerns. Burdens and trials come upon us and sometimes the last place we go is just to get alone with you and pray through. Pray through the troubles, pray through the trials, pray through the, 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 the distractions, pray through all of those things and just keep on praying until we touch your heart and you touch ours. How can we keep from singing your name? We can't. Father, bless the message today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. That song just means a lot to me. Um, I was sitting here last night in my spot. Doing what I do in that spot. Coming before God in all of my personal imperfections. And saying, God, I don't know why. You want to take time with me? I don't know why. And I just sat there and I just began to weep. I just, I sit here. And in my mind... God is sitting right there. And we just have a conversation. I've done this for 40 years. This is my spot. And in my mind, God is sitting there. And I remember saying, God, I'm so imperfect and so unworthy and so distracted sometimes. And yet you just forgive and you just keep on loving and I'm sorry. For not recognizing how precious that is all the time. Every minute of every day. And just taking him for granted. And that has nothing to do with my sermon today. I was talking to some pastors this week. And we were talking about how different 
it is to do church post-COVID than it was pre-COVID. The world has changed. It was changing pre-COVID, but it has ramped up during that. And church has become so much more difficult because people's attitudes towards church have become so different. So many people no longer feel like I need to be in a church house to be what I need to be as a Christian. And it's true. I read something this week. Somebody said, I don't need to go to church to be a Christian. And the person responded and said, yes, you don't need to go to church to be a Christian. That's true. You don't need to stay home to be married, but stay away for a few months and see how your relationship, what kind of shape your relationship's in. We live in a time where people, where, where the way the church reaches out into the community and touches people's lives needs to change. We need to find ways to touch people where they're at now. It's no longer enough to say, hey, why don't you come with me to church or just invite somebody to church or say, hey, we're going to have a, a special music event or we're going to have a, a special day. Those things are okay, but there's a lot of people that no longer see church as a necessity or priority in their life. It's just sort of a side note. If I don't have anything else going on that's important in my life, then I'll be there. But it's just sort of a thing I do once in a while. Not something that's important. And what's happening is because we're still not recognizing that and reaching out in a, in a way that might touch people's lives more impactfully and differently, we're not reaching people with the gospel of Christ. People aren't coming to know Christ the way they should because we're still trying to do it the way we did 50 years ago in reaching out to them, and they've changed. Now, I'm not saying change theology. I'm not saying change principles or priorities. But I am saying we need to look around and say, what can we do that will meet people where they are and engage with them and share with them the love of God in a way that they are going to be open to receive it? And that takes vision. Proverbs 19.21 says, Many are the plans in the minds of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Watch this video. It might be muted. Yeah, I've started over. In Asia, there's a man named Chanda. For years, Chanda and his friends broadcasted the life-giving news of Jesus into their country. While the people received it with joy, the government did not. They jammed Chanda's signals and worked to stop him. What can I do, he asked himself. Every day, there are people from my country who die without ever hearing the name of Jesus, without the hope that he brings. Chanda began to walk and pray, asking God, show me how I can tell my people about you. He walked through the hills on hot days and cold nights, praying and waiting for God's answer. Then God showed him a cow herder walking through a meadow. The cow herder seemed to be listening to his mobile phone. How can you use your mobile phone here? Chanda asked. There's no coverage. I'm not talking, said the cow herder. I'm listening. I put a chip in my phone and the chip plays music and books, whatever I want. Chanda had his answer from God. Immediately, the whole plan dropped into his head, straight from heaven. Chanda went home and bought chips for phones. He began putting sermons, books and music about Jesus onto these chips in the language of his people. He gave the chips to his friends across the country, who then gave them to their friends, who gave them to their friends. Before long, hundreds and then thousands of people were listening to the chips on their mobile phones. In the city, shopkeepers played the good news about Jesus all day. In the country, villagers who had never heard the name of Jesus gathered around their phones to hear the good news. 
Today, there are more than 700,000 people who connect to God through Chanda and his friends. And God's big story continues to spread. God is always on the move, sometimes in the most surprising places. Find this story and more at godpopsup.org. I've read about a number of people that God has used in incredible ways that they never expected to be used. People who weren't sure they were ever going to be able to make a difference. I read, a guy, I read about an insurance broker by the name of Barb Mazuski. He saw a derelict ball field in Chicago and it was all grown up and weedy and he thought, you know, that could be used in a positive way. And so he was a wealthy real estate broker and somehow he managed to get that field and um, he made arrangements to start a little league program on that field. The first 250 kids that came for it were pretty wild. They were pretty rough. They didn't know the fundamentals of baseball. But he said a thing that before every practice, they would come together and they would pray together. And there was no cursing allowed during the ball game or during the practice. And eventually, over time, he began to share the love of God with these kids. Eventually, the next year, he had 400 kids. The next year, he had 900 kids. Eventually, he had 100 of these little league teams learning about the love of God and the self-respect that they should have for one another. And he was down there. Somebody asked him, why in the world a wealthy businessman would live among the poor, coaching other people's kids? And he said, Jesus didn't say, when you've, when you've paid someone to do it under the least of these... He said, do it under the least of these. He said, it was my job to do it. God gave him a vision of how he could share the gospel in ways that nobody else was doing it. The trick is, we often wait for somebody else to give us a vision. We're used to looking to our leaders, and the leaders are supposed to tell us what the vision is. What's the vision for our church? What's the vision for our family? What's the vision for the ministry opportunities that we might be able to be involved in? Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9 says, The heart of man plans his ways. But I want you to look at the last part of that verse. But the Lord establishes his steps. In other words, God's got the plan. God knows the steps He wants you to take. God knows how He wants to use you. Terry Fulham in Leadership Magazine said, If vision is going to be owned by the people, it has to be more than something we talk them into. God is just as able to show you a vision of how you can have an impact on the lives of the people around you as he is able to tell me. He is just as able to use you to share the gospel in some way with people who hadn't heard the gospel before. He's just as able to use you as he is able to use me. But sometimes we think, well, that's our church leader's job to share the vision of ministry. I really would like you to show me where that verse is at in the Bible. Because God's given all of us His Spirit. He's given all of us a mind. He's given all of us gifts and talents. He's given all of us perspectives that are different. You see, you're going to see opportunities that other people are going to miss. I look at life through a certain set of eyes. I look at life as a man. I look at life as somebody who is 63 years old right now. Your perspective might be very different than mine. I'll guarantee you, I promise you, that, not every, <laughs> that, that, that we have different perspectives when we look at things. When Peyton looks at something... At what, you're 15 now? Almost. We'll, we'll, we'll give it to you. We'll say it's close enough. 
when Peyton looks at things at 15, he might see a whole different set of opportunities than I do at 63. Because there's things he's able to do at 15 that I can't do at 63. And I see things that he doesn't see because I've got many more years ahead of him down the path. We see different things. You look at that picture on the right-hand side. Do you see a candlestick or do you see two people looking at each other? Or can you see both? Sometimes our perspectives see different things. First time I looked at the picture, I saw a candlestick, a white candlestick sitting there, or a white vase of some sort sitting there. And then I looked a little more, and there were two people staring at each other. One of those weird things. It's all about perspective. In 2008, Paul Herbert, a municipal court judge from Ohio, was reading Rick Warren's book, Purpose Driven Life, and he was using it to disciple his daughter. One night his daughter asked him a question, Daddy, what's your purpose in life? Boy, how would you like to get hit with that question from your little girl? Daddy, what's your purpose in life? And he kind of caught him off guard and he kind of fumbled and bumbled around. He said, well, uh, my purpose is to be a light of God on the bench. That sufficed her enough for that night. But as the days went on and people kept coming before his court, he would see people coming before his court for domestic violence. He would see people coming before his court for various things. But one day, after about nine months of seeing the typical procession of domestic violence things and and things like that, a sheriff brought a a prostitute into Herbert's courtroom. Herbert realized that she looked exactly like the domestic violence cases that had been coming before her. So he began researching the criminology of prostitution and he was stunned to learn some things. About 87% of prostitutes are sexually abused, typically starting at around age 8. They often start using drugs to deal with the trauma by age 12. The girls run away, run away from home or in foster care and are dragged, they run away from home or foster care and are dragged by predatory pimps into the commercial sex trade. Herbert decided to apply his faith to his work. He launched a new program called CATCH. It stands for Changing Attitudes to Change Habits. Prior to this program, prostitutes simply cycled through the jail system. But through Herbert's two-year program, women convicted of prostitution received drug treatment, counseling, and religious training. Their movements were monitored electronically. They often supported each other, and they had to appear before him every week in court so that he could monitor their progress. He described some women who had completed his program. One of the women who had completed his program was sold when she was a little girl by her mother, to older men for crack cocaine. Today she is a Phi Theta Kappa at Columbus State Community College. Another was captured, was kidnapped by a motorcycle gang and raped, then transported to other gangs and sold for sex. She now is now two years sober from heroin and moving forward with her life. Herbert emphasized the spiritual transformation that occurred in his life. He said, the Holy Spirit continues to reveal how much I've been forgiven. I want you to hear this. The Holy Spirit continues to reveal how much I've been forgiven and how similar I am to the individuals that come before me. That's really hard to say. My job is to judge, but the Father... But the farther I go along in my faith, the more I realize that I'm just like most of them. And that makes me more understanding, more kind, and more merciful. If we don't realize that God can use each one of us to accomplish something for His glory... Regardless of where you're at in your life, if we don't acknowledge that God can use each one of us to do something and show us something, you say, well, what is it? How am I going to find out what it is? How are you going to know if you don't start asking? 
Like our little video in the beginning, he walked day and night praying, God, show me how you want to use me. And God led him to a little chip. Who'd have ever thought? Heard a farmer playing music on his phone with a little chip. And he says, there's no service here. How, how are you doing that? He says, I get this little chip and I put it in my phone and it plays music. Went home and bought thousands and thousands of chips and loaded them up with sermons and Bible stories and Christian music and started spreading them eventually to over 700,000 people. They were, being, the, they were being played in stores and every place else when they blocked his radio program. It's amazing the things that God can do today. But we have to say, God, how do you want to use me? What's the vision you want to use me for? It's too easy to sit at home. And sit around and just say, well, I'm nothing special. God can't use me. There's nothing unique about me. Too easy to do that. God didn't create us to be lazy. He created us to be bold. Proverbs 16.3 says, Commit your work to the Lord and His plans w- and your plans will be established. You see, I believe God has given you a heart for vision. You may not acknowledge that right now, but I believe God has given every person in this room a heart for vision. You see, I don't feel it. I just don't get it. I don't feel it. I don't. Whoever said feelings had anything to do with anything? When did you get the idea that feelings were supposed to determine what you're supposed to be doing in Christ? The Bible tells you to love your enemies. Is that a good feeling? If I let my feelings guide the way I'm supposed to respond to my enemies, then I'm directly opposing the Word of God. The Bible tells husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Be honest, guys. Every minute of every day, do your feelings tell you to do that? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. And hers don't either, by the way. But you do it in spite of your feelings. You do what you know God wants in your life in spite of the feelings that are telling you maybe to go a different direction. God has given us a heart for vision. There's a couple of hinge moments in world history. There's a few. One of them is... June 6, 1944, D-Day. On that day hung the balance of World War II. The fate of the world, perhaps. One of the most unknown heroes of D-Day was a man who never set, set foot on Normandy Beach. He never commanded a single troop. He never wore a uniform. His name was Andrew Jackson Higgins. Higgins was the man responsible for designing and developing those little ships that you see in the picture. They're called LCVPs. The the Navy wasn't interested in them. The Navy didn't see any need for them. The Navy wanted big ships. They wanted destroyers and battleships and big ships. And they didn't see any need for a small flat bottom ship. But Higgins said, you know what, these are going to be needed. If we're going to do landings, if we're going to do naval landings, we need a way to get from the big ships up onto the shore safely because the big ships can't get close enough. And so he began to design these ships. The Navy hadn't even placed, a, hadn't even placed a, an order for them, but he began to design them and, and produce them. When D-Day came along, he had convinced the Navy of their need. The Navy's ships went across the channel, but they couldn't get close enough. And thousands upon thousands of soldiers loaded into the LVPs. LVPs, LCVPs. And they went from the big ships onto shore and delivered thousands upon thousands of soldiers and tanks and other paraphernalia to the shore that couldn't get there any other way. And D-Day was won. Because one man had a vision. Franklin, I think it was after D-Day, it was President Dwight Eisenhower casually told a writer, Stephen Ambrose, 
He said, Higgins is the man that won the war for us. Because he had a vision that nobody else had. It all starts with a heart to see God. It all starts with a desire to see what God wants to do. What God is trying to do in your life. It all it all starts with a desire to search for God and build that relationship with God. The Bible says in Matthew 6, But seek ye first the kingdom of God. Do that first before anything else. If you're struggling to think God can't give me a vision, I don't even feel connected to God. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Then everything else will be added to you. Everything else will fall into place. You don't need to go out and start looking around for ball fields and other things and saying, okay, God, let me see what can you do with me. You just need to start by seeking God. You just need to start by, by spending time in His presence and in prayer and, and just, if, just, in, just, just covering yourself in Him and His presence. That sounds so cliché. It sounds like something you've heard a thousand sermons on before. But you know why that cliche exists? Do you know why the, 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 the urgency and the, 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 the call to spend time in God's presence is constantly being preached from pulpits all over the country, all over the world? Because if we don't start there, everything else just fades away into stuff that doesn't matter. I got a message this week from a pastor in Rwanda. And he just said, I've just been in prayer. And I just wanted to write you and say, God is so good. That's all his message was. He had just spent time in prayer and in that presence of God. He was so overwhelmed with God's presence. He just had to tell me, God is so good. When was the last time you spent enough time in prayer that when you walked away, you said, oh, God is so good. My grandma used to call it praying through. She was a Nazarene, Church of the Nazarene. And she'd say, she'd tell my, I'd hear her tell my mom, sometimes, Bernie, you just got to pray through. And one time I asked my mom, I said, Mom, what's she talking about praying through? And she said, that's just when you decide you're going to keep praying until all of a sudden you know you've broken through whatever barrier exists between you and God. And you feel the presence of God. And you know He's hearing your prayer. I've come to understand that. I've come to learn that. I've come to know how important it is. And sometimes I can pray through in a matter of minutes. And sometimes it takes a long time. Because of my old stubborn sinful self. I guess in conclusion, I just want to say this. Don't wait until someone else says, let's try this for the glory of God. Churches all over the world right now are struggling. I just got a report this week of how the Methodist church is just dividing and exploding and how the Presbyterian church is dividing and exploding and how the Episcopal Church is dividing and exploding and how, how there's just struggles going on in the organized church all over, all over the country, all over the world. How churches in Africa have had enough of the liberalism that exists in many of the American churches and are just saying we just don't want anything to do with the American churches anymore because of the liberalism that exists there. 
And I just can't help but think if we had just continued to seek God, not, not just the pastors, not just the leaders, but if we as God's people had just continued to seek God, seek God, talk to God, pray to God, pray through. What may have changed? So look around. Use your experience and your opportunities, your perspective to see opportunities. And let God give you a vision that you can share for Him with the world. I believe. I believe in your power to do great things for God. I've seen the passion that many of you have in your faith. Don't lose track of the vision God may want to use you to accomplish. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we live in a time where the world is literally running at a breakneck pace. And sometimes it feels like, Father, we're just kind of hanging on to the rope that's connected to a wild bull. And we're just trying to hold on while it's dragging us around. But Father, I pray that you will open our eyes first to see you. And second, to see your vision that you want to accomplish through our lives. Give us open eyes and receptive hearts. Cause us to look beyond what has been to what you want. To find ways to reach people that are out in this world that are not even thinking about God. Father, use us to glorify yourself. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn is in times like these. I've traveled to a few third world countries now in my life, and I've found that the heart, one of the hardest places to share the gospel has become the United States. Because people just don't care anymore. They've seen so many bad things happen in churches. And they just kind of turn church off. And in turning church off, they've turned God off. In times like these... We need our walk with Christ to be secure and our hearts open to how he wants to use us to touch those that have become cynical and closed to the typical ways of reaching them with the gospel. Let's pray for his vision as we sting. If God's spoken to your heart and you want to come talk to him about it, I invite you to come. If you're here today, although I haven't preached the salvation message, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Savior and you'd like to know how you can receive him, won't you just come and let me show you how you can do that? Let's stand together as we sing in times like these.
Delmas, could I ask you to close, please? Come to you, the fountain. Dip your heart in the stream. Of life, let the pain and the sorrow be washed away in the waves of his mercy.